what a wonderful, what a wonderful song. Thank you so much. When I had a chance to listen to a song like this, I always, you know, started thinking about it, the music in heaven. How wonderful it will be to listen to a, an orchestra in heaven, a choir in heaven with thousands and thousands of angels singing at the same time. Oh, my goodness. I'm making plans for that trip. What about you? My luggage is ready. My luggage is ready for that trip, which is my heart. And I hope yours as well. But this is why we have church every Sabbath. To help you and help myself to, to prepare the luggage. You know, prepare the heart for that trip that's coming very soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for those at home as well. I got a chance yesterday to visit Sister Joe and Gary. I know they are online. Maybe some other people are online as well. I don't know. But welcome you my friends as well and thank you so much everybody for being here today is a special day as you can see we have our table set up for the communion i just want to let you know this is an open ceremony to everybody okay that reminds us the sacrifice of jesus christ at the cross to all of us and we all have a chance we have a chance today to participate together if you don't want to participate that's okay you are free to do the, to do that you can stay here by the time you go to foot washing, foot washing right after this uh, uh, message. You can stay for a little while and then you come back to join you for the, the, uh, the program, for the communion itself. But I'd like to ask you to think about it because this ceremony is so important, so important. We never know when it's going to be our last, right? We don't know how much time we have left. Do you know? We don't know. So in this ceremony is very important to help us to renew our vows with the Lord. So you are, you are welcome to participate with us today. Please keep your Bible open in John, first in John chapter 19, again. And this is a very interesting verse, John 19, 29 and 30. As we read before, it was read before. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there. We understand by the context that the Bible is talking. John is trying to describe here the last moments of Jesus on this earth. And they filled the sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth, to Jesus' mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It was a long day for Jesus. With neither food nor sleep since the night before, when he was in jail, his body and mind were tired, as you can imagine. And due to a major loss of blood, while on the cross, his life was gradually being drained from him. He struggled to keep his mind clear so he could focus on his mission was challenged by the sympathy of those or at least one, I can say better, one soldier who tried to give him a drink of vinegar, hoping to numb his senses and ease the pain. But Jesus, according to the Bible, the verse we read, he rejected. Jesus' rejection of analgesic vinegar was his triumphant act of faithfulness in accepting the full wrath of sin. And having done that, he knew his mission was accomplished, totally accomplished. And now, in his dying breath, 
he declared, it is finished. What exactly was finished? Was he talking about his life? That was about to get finished? I don't think so. What did Jesus mean when he said it is finished? It's a Greek word, tetelestai. That's the word in Greek, he said, tetelestai. Tetelestai means it's done, accomplished. Tetelestai, he said. In fact, this was a common word used when paying a debt in full. So as it is still said today, tetelestai, it's paid. It has been paid. Tetelestai, paid in full. You paid your bill in full. You finished your bill, your car, your house. You paid in full. Tetelestai, it's paid. The ransom price had been paid in full. We sold ourselves for a full price, but we cannot buy ourselves back because that requires an impossible price. Impossible for me to pay. There is no realistic answer to the question, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 20, uh, 16, 26. That's not a reasonable answer for that question. That is our predicament. To buy back our freedom requires an impossible price. Too high that I cannot pay. Too high I don't think anybody here could pay. Anybody in the world could pay. We cannot blame God for this mess. He's not the offender. We are the offenders. And God is the offended. So our only hope would be to find someone who could pay, pay the price for us. Someone we know the answer to the enigma. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? He would have to be someone who never let himself become enslaved to sin. Although tempted as much as any other man or woman, only then would he be in a position to pay the redemption price and furthermore to pay it for us because he himself was no in need of redemption. So he didn't pay for himself. The ransom price. He paid the high price. To somebody else. He paid the high price. Not just for his friends. But also to, for his enemies. He paid in full. To save his enemies. At the cross, he said, please forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. In his last moment, Jesus is interceding to that people at the cross for God, his Father, to forgive them. The same ones that were killing him. That only hope I just mentioned is found in one single person in the whole universe. The only one who can pay the price for us, it's Jesus. And the price was his blood. Jesus does not have to give anything in exchange for his soul. 
because he's perfect. He was, is, and always will be perfect. So he was in a position to give his own precious blood in exchange for the souls of others. According to Hebrews chapter 4, Romans chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 1, and so many other Bible verses I could use this morning. Tetelestai, it's fin it is finished, means that the sacrificing of animals is no longer necessary for the forgiveness of sin. We don't need to bring any animal to the church today and having a real sacrifice here today because of Jesus. God had told Moses to instruct the Israelites to build a sanctuary so that his presence would always be with them. Exodus 25 verse 8. And this sanctuary was to contain various pieces of furniture that were to be used in a way that symbolized the ministry of Jesus. All the sanctuary sacrifices and, 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 and uh, activities in the sanctuary was pointed out to Jesus, the Lamb of God. The real Lamb of God. Thus provisions were made for the sacrifice of certain animals whenever the people sinned against God. The prophet Isaiah said that it is our sins which separate us from God. Isaiah 59 verse 2, if I'm not wrong. It is therefore the removal of sins that connect us back to God. We got to remove our sins in order to be connected with the Lord. There's a current, an energy that comes from God to us. And sin tries to interrupt the current. We got to take this out in order to receive the blessings and salvation and forgiveness from the Lord. But I don't have the power to do it. We don't have the power to do it. And that's why Jesus came to this darkness to save us, to reconnect us again with his Father. For hundreds of years, lambs were sacrificed in the temple as people sought to get right with God. And these sacrifices pointed to Christ, who would one day be sacrificed to save his people. One day John the Baptist was preaching to a crowd of people. When he saw Jesus coming toward him. And the Holy Spirit inspired John to say. Behold the Lamb of God which take away the sins. The world. This is the Lamb of God. John 1.29 so from the Holy Bible, we know that Jesus is the true Lamb. And His death on the cross brings to an end the need of a sacrifice or sacrifice of animals for the forgiveness of sin today. If each of us you have to purchase a lamb and have it sacrificed in order for our sins to be forgiven... Most of us will die in our sins because of our poverty and because according to the RaisingShip.net website, the cost of a sheep is around $300 or $400 today. It was expensive in Jesus' day as it is expensive in our days. Imagine you to buy basically once a week one sheep and bring it to the church. Three, four hundred times four, four weeks, sixteen hundred dollars at least. Would you be able to do it? Maybe somebody will, but not everybody. It would be probably be out of the question. Most of our members are poor, too poor to buy a ship per week. I couldn't. I appreciate it's not being so. Animal sacrifice was just a shadow of the real thing. 
that is ha happening in heaven today. It was not good enough to show the death of God, of God's love for us. And John 3.16 reveals the truth about God's real feelings for us when he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not, should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a wonderful Bible verse, isn't it? When Jesus died, he took his rightful place as the true Lamb of God, which ends the need of sacrifice or to sacrifice animals as a mean of being connected to God. We cannot afford to buy a lamb, but we can accept the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. That we can do it today. It is finished. Means also the end of any doubt that righteousness will prevail one day. Some people may want to believe that the death of Jesus was no big deal. That it was just a motion he had to go through. They cannot understand. They cannot see it. Well, believe me, Jesus was not pretending he was in pain. He was not faking it. It was real blood that was flowing down his face. He was in real agony at that time at the cross. It was a real groaning and crying. It was a real sword that tore through his real flesh. So what if he had decided that he could not take it anymore and call for his angels to deliver him? He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free and recreate the planet with no problem in one week. Could be much easier to him. But he died alone for you and me because he loves. He loves us. What if he decided to drink the vinegar to numb his senses so he could not feel the pain from the torture? Jesus knew that the salvation of all mankind depended on his faithfulness to his mission to death. He knew it. For without it, the unrighteous would rule the planet, the planet, and evil would prevail forever. And death will be forever. When he said, it is finished, the fatal shot against sin was fired. And it gave notice that the funeral of evil has been scheduled. So every day, every morning, every evening, sin raises its head to attack us. But not now it's only a matter of time because sin has its days numbered and it will be totally eradicated soon because of Jesus. Amen. It will once and for all be abolished. And Christ's, it is finished, testifies to it. Testifies to this. That is why today we can rejoice. Because we are certain that sin, evil, and pain would be gone for good and righteousness will prevail forever. So, When Jesus said, it is finished, he was declaring that the plan for our freedom was completed. How many of us have decided 
that we do not want to do bad things, but we keep doing it anyway. It's the nature inside us that's trying to dominate us every day. I used to say that every morning when I wake up and open my eyes, Goliath is there and I had to kill him. Every morning when I wake up, open my eyes, that's Goliath. I got to kill him. Like David did. He killed one Goliath and I had to kill many. Every day. 365 Goliaths per year. And that Goliath is my sinful nature. I got to dominate. But I cannot by myself. I need a power outside of me to help me out. And that's why Jesus sent his Holy Spirit. We feel helpless to stop. And we suffer on the inside. To think that we are hooked on habits. That we do not have the real power to stop. That's so frustrating sometimes. And you caught yourself praying for 30 years for the same thing over and over. That is evidence that we are slaves to sin by nature and sinful habits. How then can we free ourselves from these destructive habits? We have to control it. Control it. Otherwise, we are going to end up in hell. At the second coming of Jesus. Well, we cannot dominate it by by ourselves. It takes a power stronger, stronger than us to control our actions and our thoughts. And only God can provide that power for us. We are to be judged not just for our acts, folks, but Sister White says even for our thoughts. God is taking notes of our thoughts. Oh, I need the power outside me to help me out. I need God's mercy, don't you? When it comes to sin, we cannot claim to be innocent. We are not innocent. But even so, Jesus guarantees our our freedom because he died in our place. So when Jesus, our lawyer who pleads our case, tells us that our freedom is certain, there is no need to doubt, doubt it. There's no space for doubt. When he said it is finished, he was declaring To the whole universe. The end of our bondage. The end of sin's control over our lives. And the end of feeling separated from God. That's the end. So today. I call on all of us to accept. The freedom that Christ has offered to us through his death. It is time to accept it. Because when he said it is finished. Also he was declaring that we no longer have to be slaves anymore. Slaves of sin. And self-destructive habits. It means we don't have to worry about our future anymore. Because Jesus has already worked. Worked it out to our advantage. It is finished also means that he has completed the preparation of our home in heaven. And it is just a matter of time before we move on. And move in. But in order for us. To experience the benefits of his sacrifice. We must also say. It is finished. We must say it today. It is finished. We must say. It is finished. 
to our stubbornness, to our independent attitude towards the Lord. Folks, we cannot save ourselves. We don't have the ability to save, to cleanse our own hearts by ourselves. How could we reject a gift so costly and so desperately needed? We should not, and we cannot. And I'd like to finish, finish my sermon just asking you today, will you give yourself to Jesus today? Raise your hand if you want to give yourself to Jesus today. Thank you. I remember one day I asked the same question in one church, one of my churches in the past. And one lady didn't raise her hand. And, and I asked, who doesn't want to get heaven? She raised her hand in the middle of the sermon. I said, you don't want to go to heaven? I was in the evangelistic rally. She said, oh, by the way, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to go by myself. If my husband decided to stay, pastor, I'll stay with him. I said, wow. I wish my wife could love me that way. <laughs> but that wasn't, wasn't right. Salvation is so personal, right? We cannot save nobody. The only person you really can save is yourself. You can give your testimony to somebody else. You can give Bible study to somebody else. Yes, you can. But you cannot save him or her. Just the Holy Spirit can transform her, her or him and save them. Will you give yourself to Jesus today, friends? As he was nailed to the cross, let's today take a decision to nail our sins to the same cross. The cross of Jesus. May God bless you. As you take your decision today to follow Jesus as never before. It's my prayer in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.